joining Patrick Moore now for a little stargazing in this month's The Sky at Night. Good evening. This month, we'll talk about binary stars. But first, a few news notes, starting off with a rather sad one, Mars Polar Lander. Nothing was heard from it. Those faint signals didn't come from there, and search has now been abandoned. Well, you can't win them all. But far better news from near the space probe now in orbit around the asteroid Eros. And that is sending back very good pictures. See here this strange little world, less than 20 miles long, spinning round and cratered and pitted. And also detailed pictures from less than 200 miles, a rather toffee kind of thing. And look at these two hemispheres, amazing detail there. And Nia will go on sending back images for at least another four weeks, and we'll tell you more about it next month. And what about terra firma? The VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in northern Chile. Three mirrors are now working, and look at this picture, Centaurus A radio galaxy. The detail there is quite staggering, and that can match anything that Hubble can do. And now, on to our main theme. Gravity is all important. It makes up apples fall down from trees, a la Newton, holds us to the Earth's surface. It keeps the moon in this path around the Earth, and if gravity were not there, that would need a steel cable, a thousand kilometers or 600 miles across. And also, gravity keeps the planets, including the Earth, in their path around the sun. Extends far into space, in theory, to the ends of the universe. It's the most important force of all. And what about gravity and the stars and the galaxy? Welcome back now to Professor Chris Kitchen. Hello, Patrick. Chris, gravity really is all important. Yes, uh, physicists actually recognize there are four forces in the universe. Uh, two of these, are, however, only operate within atomic nuclei, and they are called the strong and weak nuclear force. Uh, then there's uh, electrical and magnetic force, and finally there is gravity. But the only one of those four which is of any significant over large distances mm. is gravity. Uh, for example, the planets are all more or less spherical in shape, because for anything that is more than a few hundred kilometers across, the forces of gravity are sufficiently strong to fracture and break the rocks and materials making up the planets and force them into their lowest energy configuration, which is a sphere. It doesn't matter, of course, or so, a tiny world, and obviously a bit of something, a broken off part of a larger body. Yes, and in many of the smaller objects in the solar system, asteroids and planets uh, and satellites of planets are just boulders floating in space. Uh, the larger planets, however, are more or less spherical, uh, although some of the more rapidly rotating ones, like Jupiter, may be slightly elliptical in shape. Gravity holds the Moon in orbit around the Earth, uh, just as it holds the satellites of the other planets in their places. Uh, however, the Moon is sufficiently large, as we can see in this image here, um, that it is perhaps better considered as a double planet rather than as a large planet with a small satellite. I agree on that. When we look out into the uh, space beyond the solar system, we can see similar dual systems uh, in the form of double stars. Here, for example, in the constellation of Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, when we look carefully at the middle star of the tail, uh, we see that it is actually two linked stars, Mizar and Alcor very close to each other in the sky. And they, of course, make up a connected system. But in many cases, double stars are not really associated at all, one's closer than the other, and we're dealing then merely with line of sight effects, and those are the optical doubles. Yes, uh, Algaide in Capricorn, for example, uh, it is a star which we can see uh, has two components to it, even without using a telescope. Uh, the two stars are separated by about a fifth of the diameter of the full moon. But although they're close together in the sky and roughly of equal brightness, the brighter, slightly brighter one of the two uh, is just 100 light years away from us, while the second is 1,600 light years away. Their alignment in the sky is thus just due to chance. There is no physical link between them. And yet, rather surprisingly, 
most pairs of stars are genuinely associated systems rather than line of sight effects. Yes, the vast majority of pairs of stars that we can see in the sky are linked by gravity. Uh, just as the Earth and Moon orbit around each other, so these stars orbit around each other. Uh, we often use the term binary star for stars that are physically linked like that and reserve the term double star for stars like Algaide where the, separate, uh, where the alignment is just due to chance. 30 degrees north of Algaide, we come to the constellation of Cygnus and the star Albireo. Looking at Albireo through a telescope, we see that it is an absolutely magnificent pair of coloured stars. Blue and gold, and if we were to observe them for many thousands of years, we would see that they are moving around each other, they are linked together by gravity, and uh, form a binary star. Uh, they behave in a similar fashion to the Earth and Moon, but of course far more slowly. But of course they're a long way apart, something like 5,000 astronomical units, one unit being the Earth-Sun distance. So the revolution period is very long indeed, many, many centuries, and you can't see the movement from year to year. But in many cases, the components of a binary star are much closer than that, and you can see the movement. Uh, yes, in a human lifetime, there are numerous binary stars where we can see the movement um, uh, quite easily. Uh, another example of a spectacular coloured pair of stars is Russell Gethy in Hercules. There the brighter star is a uh, reddish yellow and the fainter star, which is actually like the sun, can sometimes almost appear greenish by contrast. Uh, these two stars we have detected moving around each other, although here the orbital period is about three and a half thousand years. But there are binaries with much shorter periods. 15 degrees above Russell Gethy, we come to the star Rutilicus, which is also known as Zeta Herculis. And that's a binary star with a period of just 34 years. Uh, in the sky, the two stars of uh, Algaide are about six minutes of arc apart, which is a tenth of a degree. For Albireo, the separation is about half a minute of arc. For Russell Gethy, it is down to a twelfth of a minute of arc. And for Rutilicus, or Zeta Herculis, it is just 1.6 seconds of arc. That's a thirty-fifth of a minute of arc, or the size of this one-pound coin, if it were at a distance of one and a half miles. Mm, some way. Generally speaking, the uh, closer together two stars are physically, the more rapidly they go around their orbits. And for the binaries that we've just looked at, their physical separations are 5,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, 315 times that distance, respectively. Well, um, even 15 units is quite a way, about the same as the gap between the Sun and the planet Uranus. But many binary stars have components much closer together than that, and obviously then with much shorter periods. Yes, but if they get much closer together in the sky than those in Rutilicus, then they become very difficult to see as separate stars. The turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, which we see as twinkling uh, of the stars on a cold, frosty night, blurs the stars' images together and puts a practical limit of about a fifth of a second of arc on the separation that we can detect using Earth-based telescopes. That separation is about a tenth of the distance between the stars in Rutilicus. If we have a binary star where the separation is less than that, then we will see it as a single star in even the largest of telescopes. But, as you say, we do know of binary stars where the separation is much less than that. We just don't see them as two separate stars. Those stars where we do see two separate stars we know as visual binaries. Uh, they are uh, the most straightforward type of binaries to understand, uh, but in many ways the least interesting. Where the stars of a binary are too close to be seen separately, directly through a telescope, we can often detect that they are a binary through looking at their changes in brightness or changes in their spectra. The classic case of an eclipsing binary is, of course, Algol, the demon star in Perseus. Yes, the two stars in that binary are just a tenth of, a, uh, of the distance between the Earth and the Sun apart. Uh, in the sky, that makes them three one-thousandths of a second of arc apart. Uh, and with our one-pound coin, we would have to move it to a distance of 750 miles to simulate that angle. Uh, it's far too close for the stars to be seen as separate, even using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, 
But it happens that as the stars move around their orbit, uh, one star passes in front of the other, or eclipses it. Uh, part of the more distant star is then obscured, and the brightness that we see here on the Earth goes down. If we estimate or measure the brightness of Algol over a period of time, we can plot out a light curve, and we find that Algol decreases regularly in brightness at intervals of two days, 21 hours, uh, which is its orbital period. Uh, two other bright binary systems in the Northern Hemisphere are Beta Lyrae and Lambda Tauri, and their orbital periods are 12 days, uh, 22 hours, and three days, 23 hours, respectively. Uh, but not all binary systems are aligned so that we can see eclipses, only about one in ten, in fact. Uh, for the remainder, we have to rely upon the movement of the stars to see that they are not single. And we can, of course, do this by using the spectroscope. Split up your star's light, very much as water drops in our air, split up um, sunlight and produce a rainbow. And studies of stellar spectra can tell us whether the stars are single or not. Yes, the star's spectrum consists of the colours of the rainbow, but it also has numerous thin, dark lines cutting across. Those lines come from the elements which go to make up the star, hydrogen, uh, calcium, silicon, and uh, all the rest. The pattern of lines that we see in the spectrum depends upon the star's temperature. And if we have two stars with different temperatures, we will get different patterns of lines. One way in which we can tell that a star is a binary, therefore, is if its spectrum contains two patterns of lines corresponding to two different temperatures. But normally the light from one of the stars, stars swamps that from the other. Uh, then we have to rely upon the movement of the stars to pick up that they are double. That brings us on to the famous Doppler effect. If a star is moving away from us, all the lines in the spectrum are shifted over to the long wave or red end of the rainbow, if the star's coming towards us, they go over to the blue end. And in that way, we can tell how the star's moving and whether it's a single or not. Yes, as the stars go around each other, they alternately move towards us and away from us, and the lines in the star's spectrum oscillate backwards and forwards. The um, binaries of this type are called spectroscopic binaries because we only know that they are binary systems from looking at their spectra. But not all binaries just contain two stars. Uh, when they contain more than two, we call them multiple stars. And here, for example, is the trapezium in the centre of the Orion Nebula, four bright stars linked together gravitationally, but also many of the fainter stars uh, linked into the same multiple star system. We also have uh, some of the stars close to the Sun linked together, and some of those go to form part of the plough, Ursa Major. Uh, and we've already seen some of those in the uh, binary star, Mizar and Alcor. But that, in turn, is quite a complex system. Seen through a telescope, uh, Mizar itself is a visual binary, and then the brighter component of that visual binary and Alcor are both spectroscopic binaries. When we add up the results of all these ways of seeing whether stars are binaries or part of multiple systems, we find that rather more than half the stars in our part of the galaxy uh, do belong to such systems. The Sun is slightly unusual in being a singleton star. You know, Chris, binaries are fascinating in their own right, but they also give us a great deal of general information about the stars. Yes, for example, uh, the mass of a star uh, determines almost all the properties of the star its radius, its temperature, its luminosity, how long it will live for, and indeed how its life will come to an end. Yet almost the only stars where we can measure the mass are those stars in visual or eclipsing binaries. So that one of the most fundamental uh, properties of stars is known only from the study of binary stars. Binary stars are also involved in some of the more spectacular variable stars, including the exploding novae and supernovae. Uh, we can see here the 1992 nova in Cygnus uh, at its brightest, and six years later, when it had faded by a factor of 40,000, more or less back to where it started from. The reason why binary stars are closely associated with variables takes us back to where we started, the all-pervading influence of gravity. Close to each star, 
That star's gravitational field is able to trap and hold small particles, electrons, nuclei, atoms, and so forth. Further out, however, both stars' gravitational fields may become important, and small particles may be held by the system as a whole, or they may be captured into one or other star's zone of influence, uh, or they may be lost entirely to the uh, binary system. The two zones of influence of the stars form a figure of eight shape with a contact point between the two stars. Now, when a binary is first formed, the stars are very much smaller than their zones of influence. But later on, the larger star will evolve and start to expand towards becoming a red giant, and it will then fill its zone of influence. That's when the two components begin to exchange mass. That's right. At the contact point between the two zones of influence, uh, matter spills over from the expanding star towards the other star. The material being exchanged will first go into orbit around that star, uh, but later on will then spiral down and accumulate on its surface. It is this mass exchange which can release huge amounts of energy. When the second star in the system is a white dwarf, then it can lead to the explosions that we see as dwarf novae, novae and supernovae. When the second star is a neutron star, it can produce uh, X-ray binaries and X-ray bursters. And the brief but intense flashes that we can observe at very, very short wavelengths and known as gamma ray bursters may result from a binary system in which a neutron star is being ripped apart by a black hole. And speaking of black holes, binaries provide us with the best evidence for their actual existence relatively close to the sun. A few degrees northeast of Albireo, there is a faint blue supergiant. It is a binary star and it has a period of about 5.6 days. Seen in the X-ray region, uh, it is, however, one of the brightest sources in the sky, Cygnus X1. However, we can't detect the second component in that binary. And studying it in detail, it is almost certainly uh, a black hole with a mass 8 or even 10 times the mass of the Sun. So binaries come in many, many shapes, sizes and forms. And, uh, interesting, Chris, that many of these binaries can be seen with small telescopes and even one or two cases with the naked eye. So they're very worthwhile watching. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Now, Chris did mention X-rays, and binary systems are among the most important so sources of X-rays coming from the sky. And this is an exciting time. We've had the X-ray satellite Chandra, and now a new one, XMM, the new X-ray satellite, now named Newton, and that's in orbit, and begun to send back pictures. Look at this, X-rays from the large cloud of Magellan, 170,000 light years away. And this is going to be a very important source of information. Well, next month, I'll be joined by Professor Martin Ward, the University of Leicester, who will give us the latest news on X-ray astronomy and the Newton satellite. Meanwhile, don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash guide night or CFAX page 620. And next month, I'll be joined by Professor Ward and we'll give you the latest news on X-ray astronomy. Until then, good night.